I'm very excited to welcome here um, Professor Shahan Williams, who's a Sri Lankan and British trained consultant psychiatrist and a professor in psychiatry at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kanalea in Sri Lanka. After completing his training in Sri Lanka, he worked as a clinical research fellow at the Oxford Project to investigate memory and aging from 2004 to 2006 on a Commonwealth scholarship to Lineker College. Since returning to Sri Lanka in 2007, he has pursued a clinical and academic career. He was elected to the president of the Sri Lankan College of Psychiatrists from 2018 to 20. He currently chairs the board of study responsible for the training of psychiatrists in Sri Lanka. He's won presidential awards for research and is currently the co-principal on a US dollar 233,000 grant awarded to the University of Toronto um, from the Templeton World Charity Foundation um, on building character strengths and virtues in post-conflict Sri Lanka. Um, he is also president of the Lanka Alzheimer's Foundation. So um, Shahan, really warm welcome um, to Oxford. Thank you for making it in person. And we look forward to listening to your talk on Sri Lanka, religio, cultural, mental schemas and human flourishing. Thank you, Fiona, for generous introduction. It's wonderful to be here in Oxford again, and I thank the Templeton World Charity Foundation and Fiona particularly for coordinating my visit here today. Um, I want to start this paper today by talking about a unique event held yearly in Sri Lanka called the Candy SL Perahat. It's also known as the Festival of the Two. It is a festival held in July, August in Kandy, uh, the hill capital of Sri Lanka, a quaint city surrounding a little lake. The single East term Perahara means a parade of musicians, dancers, singers, acrobats, and various other performances accompanied by a large number of Caprician tuskers and elephants parading the streets in celebration of religious event. M.D. Raghavan, who is an ethnologist and who wrote the book Ceylon, a pictorial survey of the people and arts, says, in the religious and social life of Ceylon, there is nothing more resplendent than the annual candy perahel pageant. Now, the candy perahel is perhaps the biggest pageant in Sri Lanka, although this is replicated by many other temples all around the country in a smaller fashion throughout the year. This Perahera particularly is of historical significance. Um, it is thought to date back to the third century BC and was a ritual enacted to request the gods for rainfall. Now, in later years, this was combined with another Perahera called the Dalada Perahera which began when the sacred tooth relic of the Buddha was brought to Sri Lanka from India during the 4th century AD, 800 years after passing away of Lord Buddha. The current event that has been continuously done every year for the last 150 years or so is fusion of both these periods and has been uh, meaningful for the persons who participate in it. This has been not abandoned during 
World War and World War World War One and Two, where the lights had to be dim for the periphery because of the risk of airplanes or enemy warplanes seeing the lights. And subsequently, even in the last two years, despite COVID lockdown, the rulers and the people who participated or enabled this periphery did not, even in the absence of people, uh, forego this great event because it had so much meaning to the people around it. So when the British first came to Sri Lanka, as you know, from the 15th century, Sri Lanka has had various rulers. The Portuguese came to Ceylon, as it was known then, in the 1500s. Subsequently, the Dutch came along in the 17th century and took over from the Portuguese. And then finally, the British in the 18th century came and took over Sri Lanka. But the hill capital was... But again, and the issue is, and again, so here's the deal. If you want to talk to Karen, I mean, you can encourage her to talk to me or encourage her to say that, you know, your parents love you. They're probably going to have a shit. But after they do, you know, they're going to want us to help. They want us to talk to them and see if you can help. Or whatever, you know. But I think she needs to gently impart the temple to continue this ritual. Now this periphery has immense significance to the people. It is a grand parade conducted con for 10 consecutive years where elephants numbering 60 to 80 are paraded through the streets, perhaps in the day or even in the nights, lit up and decorated. And you you will never see a spectacle such as this anywhere in the world today. And I'm not sure how long this will continue considering protests, perhaps related to of the elephants that are used in this parade. However, this event had the significance of also bringing together two religions, both the Hindu religion, which had various gods, and also the Buddhist tradition coming together to bring about rain yearly, which was very important for the agricultural societies that have existed for centuries and based uh, their livelihood on the rain coming at the right time. Now the whole ritual per, per se enacted this need for rain. In fact, the belief was that if you recreated the whole process of rain through this ritual, then the gods would in turn bring the rain. So the Perehara was led by people carrying whips and they cracked these whips Noises. And this, in, in a sense, parallel or uh, brought about the information to the people that the Perehera was on its way, but it also was symbolic of thunder, of the noise that came preceding the rain. And we also had the fireworks and the people who brought in various fire dancers, fire eating and so on. Again, symbolic of lightning that was uh, heralding the rain. This was followed by hundreds of dancers who brought out the various dance forms which had evolved over the centuries in Sri Lanka. These are very formal traditions which even today have uh, years of training and which are very acrobatic in nature and need uh, varied skills for people to acquire. Many of these dancers would be among the best and they have to compete to be part of this Perehera and they would have 
various qualifications which they would have achieved along the way, which have been formalized within the tradition, which eventually enables them to participate in this character. And finally, come the elephants. Elephants, by tradition, would have been dark, black, symbolic of the clouds filled with water, coming eventually to open up and give the much wanted rain. So this, in my understanding, would meet the whole concept of human flourishing to a whole generation or a whole group of people, a community that lived and worked in this backdrop, where we see, if you look at the UNESCO, paper on human flourishing, we identify three main categories of what constitutes good. First, having relationships with family members, friends, community members, citizens, animals, and the environment, which was what this whole ritual enacted. It was about people being engaged in activities, in play, in work, in learning, in caring. And this was also the agency through which they brought change. Now, I'm happy that my son is here today as part of his architectural project. And in doing his undergraduate work in Sri Lanka, one of his assignments was to design a platform in this city of Kandy where he visited, where the elephants could be decorated because people can spent a year doing these costumes and eventually you had to put it onto the elephant and you had to have a platform where elephants could walk by, where you could put on these costumes which they could be dressed up on. So he had this opportunity to meet various artisans and so on to understand the whole uh, tradition behind this uh, interesting event. Now, this whole ritual brings about a certain understanding of the worldview or what as a psychiatrist I would call a mental schema of the people who live in the South Asian world. Because the South Asian world is full of rituals and various religious enactments. Now, in this worldview, there are two worlds that exist in our mind. And I have put them separately because they rarely meet. There is the world of faith and a world of science. And both these worlds exist within the mental schema of every person. Now, faith is not just belief. Belief encompasses many factors. We believe in so many things in our lives, not necessarily based on science, based on our upbringing, our expectations, and so many things we learn day to day. But within that, we have a framework where there is a framework which is determined by faith, and a smaller framework, perhaps, in the South Asian world, which is determined by science. This is a, they rarely meet, but you would find scholars trying to bring them together the world of science and the world of faith and trying to find meaning in the connection uh, or trying to establish some common ground between the two. And faith again, let me say, is not just spirituality. Spirituality is something very abstract. It is about something supernatural. But faith in the South Asian context very much a belief in a particular religion, maybe Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, or Hinduism, and its core beliefs. And this is something that's lived out. It determines the way I dress, determines what I eat, and determines how I live life. And mind you, 25% of the world lives in South Asia with big countries such as India, Pakistan, 
and Bangladesh, each one perhaps very much defined by the religious communities within there. Now, almost all Sri Lankans are religious. The majority in Sri Lanka comprises Buddhists, and all of them would be very much practicing or also having as part of their education in schools a specific stream where they only and exclusively study their religion. So there is no, they grow up in silos, but they all believe in a, a particular religion, which is very much in contrast to maybe England. Yeah, you would find that in the 2011 census, Christianity was around 60%, but if we see a significant non-religious group up to around 25%, such a change to happen in South Asia also would take, to me, a long, long time, and I don't see for the next 50 years, perhaps even as Noha Harari perhaps would argue, that communities have the need or had the need for religion in the context of certain needs that existed in societies. But that those needs perhaps still exist in today's society in South Asia. Now, what is the significance of this mental schema or worldview to me? And why am I talking about this? Because of two clear uh, objectives or issues that I work on. And one is what is called the Project Leaves, which we are working on, where we are developing character strengths for school children. And we are piloting it in Sri Lanka. And in our sort of research and discussions on how we integrate character, we had to take into a project this whole aspect of integrating religion or faith into our character building initiatives. Because this was a huge ele elephant in the room and we cannot <laughs> try to build character <laughs> without addressing the core mental schemas that existed in the minds of the people. And secondly, making psychological therapies relevant to the South Asian world, which is more in terms of psychiatric training. So the project that we are working on, on the Templeton Foundation Charity um, Grant, is a project called Leadership, Personal Growth and Social responsibility. Now, I think people like Richard Dawkins would argue that religion and faith perhaps is more harmful. It's done more harm to societies than good. But in our understanding, we had, we had the good. We've had some bad experiences too in the South Asian world with clashes among faiths and so on, and the tensions that it has caused. So obviously, in a post-conflict Sri Lanka, with all the four major religions involved, we need to bring about understanding of each other's religion and common threats that we can integrate into our efforts in bringing leadership, personal growth, and social responsibility among our students. So up to now, our schools did not have a specific character development strand. As I said, all schools had religious education, but every student based on his or her religion went through his religion and invariably they came out holding on to the belief that their religion or their way was superior to all other religions of faith. I must say that 
despite such understanding, people did live, live amicably and uh, well almost all the time. But nevertheless, we saw within our project the need to integrate some of the common strands in this space to bring about the messages that we were going to take forward. This project was based on an online module which involved gaming and interaction for children which between 12 to 14 years of age which was just going into from primary school to secondary school just much earlier than their GCSE so they had more time to think. From a psychological perspective this was a period where children were moving from more concrete thinking to an operational thinking mindset where they could sort of debate and understand and which was relatively free, free period where they could allow their minds to grow and expand and not be sort of stifled by the need to achieve academically, which came on in the later years when they went on from 14 to 60, where they had to sit for their GCSEs or ordinary level exams. So we also brought it in at a time just when COVID struck and lots of lessons went uh, online. So it was an opportunity for us to get this across to the students and we are still delivering them across 10 modules to this and piloting it in the district of Gampaha, which has three population of 3 million, which is in the Western province, a very populous uh, part of the Western province. Um, Happy that despite the COVID constraints, we've been able to take it through. We've had challenges with smaller schools where we've had an issue about data. So we've been able to help the schools to get free data and so on through our project and also help them with smartphones as and when possible um, through uh, to get children to participate. So the modules that we looked at would have to integrate, as I said, the different religious traditions. And our first module on respecting others and conflict resolution would start with this page, maybe, where hatred is indeed never appeased by hatred in this world. It's appeased only by compassion. This is from the Dhammapada, from Lord Buddha. And then we would complement it by verses from the Bible and also from the Quran, so that they could see the common strands in each religion, which brought about certain values, common values that we had to integrate. So in every module, we tried to bring in the whole idea to make it more acceptable, more sort of uh, uh, understanding and more closer home to the children who participated in our program. So they had other activities too, looking at the beauty and history of Sri Lanka. And these were other activities they had. We are look at it closely. A family of tourists from Britain. Uh, you have met in the train, are interested in iconic locations around Sri Lanka. They are showing a set of pictures of culturally significant landmarks in the country in their mobile phone. Help them by naming the landmarks in the part of Sri Lanka in which they are situated. So obviously, many of these landmarks are religious in nature. They mean have different religious uh, monuments, temples, churches, mosques, and so on. So that the children through this activity also learned about the other important monuments, which were significant in the country. And we also brought in in our modules, this is about the mind, which is very much an Eastern concept of self-reflection, of calming your mind down, of mindfulness, which is something that's now been even investigated uh, 
in Oxford, and I understand the British Parliament too spends a few minutes uh, uh, being mindful. <laughs> so uh, these are concepts we have integrated into our module in bringing about character strengths. <clears throat> so I now move on to the second aspect um, that I am also interested in, in terms of education and understanding the different schemas and how they help have relieved suffering in the greater concept in the greater context. Now, interestingly, we realized that uh, when I went back to Sri Lanka after obtaining my membership in 2007, um, there were perhaps 20 psychiatrists in Sri Lanka and we had a population of 20 million people. So I was <laughs> one in a million. <laughs> um, however, uh, things have changed. We have around 150 psychiatrists, but still uh, just a few to meet the needs. Um, for instance, three times the population of Sri Lanka, 60 million people or so, or a little bit more than 60, I suppose, it has fell to 13,000 psychiatrists today, and plus psychologists and many other teams uh, supporting people. And post-COVID, it's been, I know, a challenge for even the most uh, resourced uh, mental health services. So for countries like ours, with you know India having a billion people or more, 1.2 billion, I mean, how many psychiatrists and how many psychologists would they need if we try to give the psychological services that uh, we provide and the therapies that we give one to one and how do we need meet the beginning and how do I relieve or how do we relieve the suffering um, if uh, people need them. So again we need to go back into people's phrase and how they go about things. So this is by an anthropologist uh, from the University of Colombo who recently uh, wrote this piece where he said during times of uncertainty and danger people often use rituals to reduce their stress and exert control over their environment. The global pandemic is also a time of significant transition and uncertainty when people have greater need for physical and social support. Over the past year people have used their ritual traditions strategy for invoking supernatural power to control the spread of COVID in their communities. In Sri Lanka is no issue. So as human beings, we are all struggling for control. We look around us, whether it be political or in any realm, it's all about having control. And COVID put us in disarray. Those of us who believe in science, hope that science would bring the vaccine, the solutions. But for thousands of people, perhaps in South Asia, to whom vaccines would be really far away or long time to come. They have no uh, other recourse but to treat or look at supernatural or the faith-based control that they may need. In fact, the past uh, or the, the Minister of Health in Sri Lanka who had to step down eventually uh, was uh, ridiculed in many quarters for having filled a uh, pot with blessed water and pouring it into a river and uh, hoping or making a spectacle of it uh, and telling people that it would help people overcome COVID. Um, thankfully, not everyone subscribed to this idea and Sri Lanka is, uh, has, has had uh, the vaccines and almost all the people have been vaccinated. And despite whatever the supernatural or other world beliefs they had, people have come forward to get the vaccines. And I think the vaccination success rate is as good as any other um, Western country. However, people needed certain supports to help their mental frame, to face the uncertainty that came with COVID. So this was another interesting issue uh, 
that we had to take up in post-conflict Sri Lanka. These are some of the papers that uh, I was part of uh, the recent uh, last two years where we looked at grief because uh, grief was a huge issue post-tsunami. As you know, Sri Lanka was affected by tsunami. So many people went missing. They disappeared uh, and uh, they never, uh, the families never got confirmation of their death. And it was similar in the context of uh, uh, civil unrest, which uh, continued till 2009, where yeah, hundreds of thousands of people died, and some of them went missing. And uh, there was particularly trauma in both uh, quarters. This was a study done, with, done in the south of Sri Lanka, but in 2016, I took a seven uh, was part of a government mechanism. Uh, uh, Office of uh, National Unity and Reconciliation, where I spent a year in Jatna, the northern part, uh, looking at ways of supporting people psychologically and seeing how they dealt with trauma. And one of the things that struck me and was quite disturbing was see a lot of these rituals being performed. Um, we are lots of temples uh, enacted. Uh, these sort of self-inflicted injuries and uh, people hanging from hooks when they had uh, their celebration or the temple activity. It was later that I came across an interesting book written by an anthropologist who looked at this whole aspect of suffering in terms of these rituals and brought out the fact that these were a subconscious inaction or uh, uh, display of people sort of bringing out the fact that suffering in some way had meaning, had purpose. It brought them closer to God or closer to their faith or spirituality. Through suffering, people achieve something good or something greater. And that this was in some way uh, an inaction of the suffering they have been through and how it might uh, also be something that they had to relive in the future or in some ways a community coming together and celebrating or accepting the suffering as part of their very lives. So much so that I did some research on post-traumatic stress disorder and depression and so on. And despite every family having serious trauma, having lost somebody, having seriously affected, displaced, having ended up at, as refugees in camps, in sickness, and so many difficulties, having lost almost everything, they were very resilient coming out and living life and not uh, being. Uh, affected as much as I would have affected, uh, expected them to be. And from time to time, reenacting these rituals through their uh, religious activities, which brought on a sense of oneness in the community. Going on to other therapies, like cognitive behavior therapy, which is uh, often delivered. Uh, in conditions like depression or obsessive compulsive disorder. Again, along with the psychologists, we debate the usefulness of some of the rituals that are performed. For instance, in cognitive behavior therapy, we would encourage behavioral activation for the person who's depressed, maybe going out for a walk, doing things outside. Now, in our context, if you ask for middle-aged uh, female having so many responsibilities at home up to you know wearing a pair of tennis shoes and going for a walk it could seem very alien to them however the bodhi puja which is about a ritual where people go around the bow tree and they pour water on it and do various things for which they would perhaps wake up in the morning make some milk rice which they would take to the temple and offer to the priests and then do this walk around the tree for maybe 20 times or 50 times. 
could sort of in a way help them uh, similar to behavioral activation so that when they come back home by afternoon the depression has lifted because depression has a diurnal variation and by evening most people if they are biologically depressed feel better if they've engaged in activities and so on. I will not go into the details of obsessive compulsive disorder but again dealing with obsessive imagery which is perhaps very much religious in nature for many people uh, in, in the context of South Asia have to be dealt with differently from how we dealt with here. Thinking of the issue of alcohol and drug dependence, again, there's so much evidence, even in the best of from the best of centers, that programs of alcoholic anonymous, which are more sort of faith-based interventions, are equally efficacious as some of the other models that we have practiced, such as CBT or medical interventions which may not be very realistic again in our context. Uh, if we were to try medical interventions, we would have to have so many clinics, so many centers, dishing out medicines and so many other things. Whereas using faith-based interventions, we may be able to reach a bigger group of people. And this is a paper from the USA which supports uh, how spirituality and the celebrate recovery participants uh, do do well in, in the religious setting when coming out of uh, alcohol or drug dependence. There is also the concept of acceptance and commitment therapy, which is very um, sort of upbeat these days. Um, lots of uh, papers and books coming out on it, where when people go through suffering and they go through difficulty, how we eventually end up accepting and committing ourselves to our current situation. Now, in the South Asian context, this would be something very common because in the Buddhist or in the Hindu philosophies, karma or accepting my present because of perhaps certain uh, wrongdoings or certain things that happened in my past birth may help me accept and commit to the current or in a Christian or Islamic perspective, it could also mean it's what God's given me and I need to commit to this and I need to accept this. So accept and commitment therapy would more be sort of relevant to a person who lived a secular life, but not for a person who lived a faith-based life in one of our communities. Again, another interesting concept called borderline personality disorder. Have a dialectical behavior therapy, which integrates a lot of mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness is an approach independent of religion, but in the Eastern context, it's very much a part of the Eastern religions. Where people would integrate meditation even into their school life, where they would do certain uh, self-awareness, uh, religious mindfulness activities. So, as a clinician, I look at person-centered care, and I completely think that faith determines underlying mental schemas and these schemas are very much wired into the brain. It's another area of work that would be very interesting to look at how beliefs get integrated into brain circuits and how we respond to certain situations and actions, and how we determine character. And finally, this is something that um, few of us are developing some work on whether we can deliver therapy without understanding these schemas determined by faith when it comes to psychological therapies and whether psychiatrists and psychologists can give um, therapy to people with just a patchy understanding of their faith and they may need a or need further training in the core beliefs in each religion and how they can be applied to this person in front of them to give them uh, a better life or better uh, well-being as it were. So thank you for listening to me. I need to acknowledge uh, my uh, co-investigator and mentor, Professor Arun Ravindran, who holds the grant uh, with the Templeton World Charity Foundation. My colleague, uh, who's less most of the work, 
Dr. Miru Chandradas, uh, who is using this work uh, to do his PhD. He's already a child and adolescent psychiatrist, uh, doing the work on the modules and developing them to work with the children. Um, and my acknowledgments also to the Pustan World Charity Foundation, my colleagues, close friends, patients, and the community that I live in, which sort of stimulate and bring about the ideas I have presented today. So I'm open to criticism, I'm open to your views. Uh, I'm not, I cannot post off an expert in this area. I'm still learning. So thank you for your time. Thank you for that incredibly rich and diverse um, discussion and, and, you know, that touched so many areas, both kind of education and health and, um, and religious education in particular in the context of Sri Lanka. I'm sure we have lots of questions um, both online and um, here in the auditorium. For those of you who are online, please raise your hand or write your um, question in the chat. And um, we look forward to discussing this fascinating talk further. Um, David. Yes. Thanks very much for your talk. I really, really enjoyed that. And uh, uh, particularly, I'm uh, very fond of uh, Sri Lanka. And I, uh, it, was never, it was never planned. People always accuse me of having planned my research trips to Sri Lanka when the England cricket team played. Uh, <laughs> so I enjoyed many, many, uh, many afternoons of cricket in Kandy and Colombo and um, so forth. I was struck by two things in your, in your talk. One was the um, one in a million, which I really loved. Uh, and um, but I did wonder, really, um, in the context, for example, of the, the conflict in uh, Sri Lanka, um, which you know, you know better than all of us, was prolonged and bloody and affected many, many people, uh, and of course other events. When one compares uh, that uh, dark and difficult history of Sri Lanka to countries like Rwanda, <clears throat> where, you know, uh, similar tension between groups uh, occurred, or South Africa, where there was strife and, and uh, conflict between human beings. In both Sri Lanka and South Africa, they didn't actually necessarily turn to the one in the million psychiatrists who was available. They had community processes left. That, that that's, I can never say the word, but, uh, uh, you know, all the truth and reconciliation conditions, and where people have in many other parts of the world, in Latin America, found ways of dealing with uh, trauma and, con uh, you know, through conflict or natural disasters like earthquakes, uh, by finding within communities a way of healing and a way of coming to terms. And it strikes me that, you know, uh, that part of your paper seems to suggest somehow that um, the science you speak about as opposed to, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more than faith, it's a, a, a way of, of, uh, of understanding, uh, somehow continues to stand in conflict. Uh, and certainly my experiences elsewhere is that people manage these mental schemas in ways that are uh, much more clever and much more significant. Um, 
So I just really want to ask about that. Certainly, David, I agree with you. It's, that's exactly what I'm trying to bring out uh, through this talk. Um, that uh, you know, we, we we don't have to rush in and do a you know some form of therapy here or some form of therapy there. And it's been an issue too post tsunami and <laughs> post where war where particularly sometimes uh, Western funds did fund that people to. Uh, come in and do various forms of therapy. I'm not sure how useful it was and how much people were interested really in, in seeing. That was the same experience I had in 2016 when I went up to uh, the north to do some work. I, I realized that I could be doing more harm than good by trying to offer people therapy or setting up psychological services. Um, one of the people who, one of the persons who worked on this was Professor Daya Soma Syndrome. He's now based in Adelaide, he was the previous uh, professor of Jatna, and he sort of uh, again has written a few papers on more psychosocial support rather than psychological support for the people to sort of get on with their lives while also bringing the communities together and, and uh, sort of mingling with them and enabling them to use their own ingenuous ways to sort of recover from what they were going through um, rather than trying to, you know, probe and prod and getting them to relive the trauma again uh, in, in ways known to us. Um, it's still an area that needs a lot more research and science uh, looking into. So uh, even I'm sort of lost sometimes as to what I should offer. And I would say that uh, something out there and I struggle to understand the, the various dynamics of that's what's going on around me and to understand the aspect of their mental understanding of each situation and how their narrative is. And one of the things that seemed to have some effect was something called narrative exposure therapy where people sort of brought their trauma again into a narrative yeah, even for the people who were really affected, where yeah, they had PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, which wasn't very much, I must say, uh, in terms of what we or people would expect to see, despite the sort of extent of trauma many people went through. Even those who were badly affected could be helped through a process of narrative exposure therapy, which I think uh, was it a Norwegian group who really worked on that uh, with the University of Jaffna in trying to help in this aspect. They did work in other areas through it. Somewhat closer to what would be sort of meaningful to the people. Well, thank you very much. Um, Ellen, um, Sure, thanks. Thanks, Fiona. Can everyone hear me all right? OK, wonderful. Well, Shehan, it's really lovely to, to see you again. It seems like it has been a couple of lifetimes since we were in the Bahamas together. A lot has happened between 2019 and now. Um, but, but thank you so much for, for a really fascinating presentation. I wanted to just pick up on something you said at the end that really, uh, really resonated with me. And this is, this is the idea of personalized medicine or personalized therapy. And, and you hear this a lot these days. And I've always heard it referred to in a more biomedical context when people are talking about, you know, which drug to give or sort of tweaking particular doses. But this idea that in order to really essentially provide a patient with the best and most appropriate therapy that you need to understand their worldview or what it means to them to live the good life, I think is is really profound. And it speaks to, you know, potentially a different approach to how medical professionals are trained to engage. Um, so I'd just love to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on that specifically, like, you know, in your experience, are psychiatrists, are therapists, are they open to this? Like, is, is that something that they're interested in? In. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, lovely to see you again and 
thank you for your kind comments. Uh, yes, uh, I think it's it's an aspect psychiatrists are open to, but as you said, we need to sort of take this message uh, uh, forward and we need to get more people interested uh, and, and thinking beyond, uh, again, their boxes, because human beings are diverse, uh, their beliefs are different, uh, the way they think and act is so different that we, you know, have this uh, struggle all the time as to what's really good for people. And it's, I think, something psychiatrists are quite open to, unlike in rest of medicine, because we struggle day to day when it comes to mental illness uh, and, and the treatment of mental illness as to when we should treat somebody and when we shouldn't, uh, how uh, sort of... Uh, assertive should we be, should we allow people to continue the way they are without interfering too much or just making this judgment that somebody is mentally ill and, and a certain treatment is the option for them. Uh, this uh, balance is always something we struggle with because does it matter if, if somebody thinks differently? It may not be the mainstream belief. Uh, is it wrong for even a person to have a delusion if it's something that benefits them and doesn't affect uh, the others and uh, which in some ways has meaning to that person? So these are struggles we always work with. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, person-centered care and understanding the person would something be something that psychiatrists would be open to but uh, we need to sort of always be aware of it. And I think this is an area that we need to develop a little bit more in terms of understanding. So as I said, I would really be keen to you know, write a paper looking at the different faiths and you know, how some of those concepts and ideas of well-being can be integrated into therapies for people. Thank you. Um Oh, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I have enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of connections with the the project that we are doing uh, in Kenya, uh, especially the one on and uh, with children, you know, between uh, 14, okay, 11, you know, we start at 11, uh, 15 adolescents, helping to form character and using the various uh, uh, religious values to incorporate uh, into their character uh, development. Uh, my question and uh, uh, help from you would be, how did you, I mean, have you got into the formal education system of Sri Lanka to be able to uh, input that component? And how did you do that? Because for us, we've been doing it on the side as part of our, I mean, like uh, parallel or you know, an input that the children can have. So I'd like to to learn from you how you you did that, and then the the what aspect of ritual have you incorporated into that uh, into that program? Thank you. Thank you for that. I think, uh, yeah, I, I must say we're very fortunate mm -hmm. we are in sort of mainstream education in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we started off, I was really worried whether we would be able to cross this barrier. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, uh, um, my team members, they're wonderful really. Uh, we have some wonderful people as part of our team. Mm -hmm. And they went and met the education team. I must say that I didn't get involved, really. Mm -hmm. I was behind the scenes. I thought at some point I would have to get involved. They just went and spoke to the education department. We had the university behind us. Mm -hmm. So 
where we mentioned that we were doing it as part of the university because in this district, the education officers were very keen. They said, yes, we need character. We've been asked to bring this in. We've been thinking how to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are so happy that the university has come forward with a team of people who will help us in this. But, so we have been given the official permission in all the major schools, so then we had some meetings and so on, meeting all the principal for the heads of the schools, mm -hmm. having discussions with them. We had challenges in certain schools, but we had people visiting them, explaining them to them the project and what was going on. Um, and uh, we sort of came in to sort of give some introduction. And they have been more than happy, but we had challenges in terms of COVID because of you know, school closures, they had so many pressures mm -hmm. uh, in terms of having to finish the school curriculum. And this is something that's piggybacking on that, and this is not linked to examination. Mm -hmm. And exactly what we wanted, because we wanted this to be something uh, that was according to do. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was very much a game that they played, or something they did during their free time. They, they, did, they got stars and mm -hmm rewards and awards coming on to the computer mm -hmm. when they did this. And in some of the schools, they really liked it and they took on to it. Mm -hmm. um, as always, the girls' schools mm -hmm. really uh, did well. Mm -hmm. Many of the girls' schools, uh, the girls uh, really completed mm -hmm. on time. The boys were a bit slower in, in getting into it. And then we had, uh, uh, from, the, from the rural schools, we had to do a bit more pushing and we still have a little backlog to clear, but some schools are finishing up all the modules. And uh, in terms of ritual, we, we really didn't have any rituals within the, uh, the module. It's more about uh, very sort of active, pragmatic, fast-moving module, which you know, 12 to 14 year olds would be interested in. But subconsciously, it linked together the very many beliefs they had and, and what uh, they learned from their other streams and Sri Lanka and history, world history, other cultural aspects in this whole uh, domain of uh, leadership and character building, case studies, bringing in children, you know, situations, asking them to solve these problems and uh, what would be the right leadership move in terms of, you know, a certain situation, how they will enact them and then also maybe self-control and anger management and things like that, for which perhaps we would have introduced to them within those modules, you know, ways of coping with anger in terms of, you know, doing some mindfulness or some meditative activity to calm themselves down and to relax uh, when they feel stressed, like they were in an exam situation and they would feel extreme stress, you know, how do they cope with it, how do they handle it sort of thing and how measures could be adapted were sort of integrated into this module. So I'm really uh, very excited because I'm hoping we'll, we'll complete this uh, at the end of this year. We still haven't brought it out into the public realm as such. It's very much under wraps still. In fact, I told my co sort of uh, the team not to sort of get it out there yet because we don't want people objecting or protesting or asking us, how did you get it into the you know official stream? without, you know, having consultations and all these things. So what we want to do is first finish the uh, evaluation and see how it's worked. So part of this uh, university work that we are doing and then come out with it. And then we have to send it to the great education ministry so that we can then get it across the whole country, which is our eventual goal of getting this for 12 to 14 year olds into the stream online character development module, uh, which will again not be sort of the current scheme is about didactic teaching. Yeah, you know, teachers go and say, you need to be truthful, you know, you need to be good. And children sit there and okay, this uh, <laughs> morning we saw you, you know, telling this lie to this other teacher, you know, and things like that. It's, it's a bit of a joke, really. So this is something they, they do themselves and learn and get them to think. Um, and uh, well, there are maybe <laughs> the, the talent would be to see whether there is a change, which is what we are trying to see. And we are trying to work out some. We do have a pre test and a post test, mm -hmm. which we want to work on. We have a control group and we have a group that is running with these modules. So we are doing this uh, test for both these groups. 
to see whether you know, the thinking has uh, changed to an extent. It's not easy, such uh, sort of evaluation uh, methods, but uh, that's a uh, sort of ultimate goal. If we can show that we have a case to expand it to the whole country, and perhaps also think of, you know, spreading it down after the South Asian region, because most of these can be translated and used. It's been translated to our languages. And this is, uh, we have a uh, one of the top end uh, IT groups in Sri Lanka working with us on this project. And they are also very keen because they too believe that this is a very important project and they have also been very charitable in reducing their fees and so on to help us uh, with this initiative. So, some follow up. <laughs> Luana. Um, I actually just have a quick question about the curriculum itself because um, it sounds like it's a very individually driven thing, right, like where the students do it on their own time. Um, I'm interested in whether there's anything in the works or whether any parts of the, the curriculum itself deal also with aspects of intersocial relationships, like among the kids that are going through the program and whether that filters in through the I think that's an interesting question, Lana. You know, we don't uh, sort of evaluate that aspect of it in terms of how much interaction and how it leads to the students looking at it. I'm sure there's some unofficial work or unofficial interaction going on and children competing and discussing some of the concepts, but we're not evaluating that. We are we have another master's students, students looking at uh, um, how teachers feel about this sort of character module among students and what they think they see as changes among the children and the students uh, when they're going through this. And also uh, feedback from students as to how they feel or what uh, they feel about the modules that we are delivering looking at various aspects including how we sell them, how we sort of form their thinking, how acceptable it is to them and uh, how friendly it is in terms of you know, learning through this platform. Cuts. I, I wonder if I might challenge or, or trouble your concept of faith um, as a way that I think might actually help the, the theory that you're developing and, and thinking through why this makes an impact. A lot of, as, as more scholars and anthropologists and scholars of religious traditions are emerging from non-European traditions, one of the major challenges that they've had of Western concepts of the study of religion or of faith is that it's very German 19th century. It's very much about belief that the, the center of, of faith is somehow the, the intellectual proposition that I believe in God. Or and uh, uh, Emily and I have been talking a lot about Otto de Betek, which I pronounced very badly, but also there's a, a wonderful Brazilian anthropologist philosopher now who's, who talks about philosophy to the rhythm of atabakis, the rhythm of the drums, um, insisting that many people think through their bodies. And I think that if we consider faith in that way as well, that faith is not so much a, a kind of belief, it's not a subcategory of belief as your Venn diagram had it, but that faith is actually a, a question of practices together with which Mental propositions are one of those things. The reason I say all of this is that, for instance, the we you and I talked earlier about the, the people who put hooks in their bodies and hang or pull things, and how that is, in fact, a way to deal with trauma. Um, that there is there is something really powerful about that practice, whether it's being together, whether it's the pain whether it's a repetition, and I think that it might be interesting to think about it in terms of Freud. Freud develops this idea of repetition and, and for dealing with post-traumatic stress, or shell shock at the time, um, because if people could talk about it and repeat it through talk, then they could sort of get past it. They didn't have to involuntarily repeat because they could voluntarily repeat. That's great for some intellectual in Vienna in 1920, after the Second World War, after the First World War. But for somebody in the north of Sri Lanka, it may well be that the repetition of pain serves that. So if we think about uh, that the way that the body thinks, the way that the, the body believes, the, if we think about faith and, and, and philosophy, not through here necessarily, 
which works for us here at Oxford, but for many people in the world think in different ways. So I guess I just want to present a, that might be an interesting way to think your your study in a different way is that faith is not a, a type of belief that faith is a, a practice which permits, among other things, many of the things that you describe. I think that's an interesting thought. Something worth pondering. Yeah, because uh, you, you raised this very true. It's perhaps more than just a thought here and it's something lived out very much uh, what you function. And but I think in terms of uh, in South Asia the Victorian era in terms of era in terms of faith. So I may be wrong there. Well, the reason that I, that I brought up the question is because of the, the festival that you began talking about. Because it's a, it's a, a common festival which shows the, and that's practiced by both Hindus and Buddhists and which expresses this, what exactly you said, so many of the, the elements of human flourishing are there. And that it's a way of, of thinking being together. There, there is something really important about a physical form of philosophy, a physical form of therapy that's there. Uh, and so the reason that I started thinking about it was exactly because of your comments. It's, it seems as if there is something that's tremendously bodily about the form of faith that you're describing. And that's wonderful. This is something that we are impoverished by. I just follow, follow this up, but maybe the, uh, with a slight variant. Um, we talked about the Victorian era and so on, where, um, you, you know, the idea of character and character formation. Um, certainly in, in Victorian times, um, whether Yale or elsewhere, whether it insisted. Um, you, you know, the idea that people would be allowed to um, become aware of their feelings and express them publicly was a sort of, you know, you get, get, get character and character development was being able to, that's right, you know, you, you, um, you grew to accept things. And, uh, you know, today if you watch a sort of Premier League football match in, in Britain, the commentators will always say he shows his, you know, he's, he, he, he displayed his character. And it is more through action rather than somebody sort of, you know, uh, catharting on the football pitch, you know, uh, I feel so hurt or I, I, I'm so empathetic towards you, etc. But character is actually demonstrated through, through action. Um, uh, and but, but that action can be both physical or, uh, in a sense, just um, you know what we might call stature. That people walk away rather than engage in meaningless argument. And that's a demonstration of character. And it just seems to me that you know, although you do a great job, and many people are developing all these modules, and it's about trying to get people to get into there's something very sort of, you know, um, 1940s Freudian psychology about that, you know, sort of American pursuit that everyone pays their therapist to go in for a private 55 minute session and then come away having been encouraged to depart, uh, to lie on a couch and tell your therapist uh, your feelings. And I, I just, I just despair a little bit because um, a lot of cultures uh, in South Asia, in Africa, have, you know, have developed over many, many moons different ways of encouraging that kind of uh, ways to depart, ways to get in touch with feelings. And I just wonder whether these sorts of formal courses 
know, aimed at individuals, those who can afford it, is somewhat, runs somewhat contrary to really how people have learned to become, uh, to, to, to discover. But I don't know, you know, you tell, you tell us, you're the psychiatrist. <laughs> I, I, mean, I think you're right, but at the same time, it's also about getting students to think and think through some of it. There are be various levels of students interpreting the modules in different ways mm. and, and deriving different concepts and um, different thoughts. They, they may well, in fact, go beyond what we are presenting to them, and uh, they may, you know, even in terms of intellectual or moral development, um, people are at different levels. Mm. You know, people, there are so many who would just stop at the black and white level of you know, cool and what's right and what's wrong, but there are many others who would move on to higher levels of morality and, and argument. So this would more be a, a basis, a, a common ground. On, at which, you know, at a very sort of fundamental level, they think beyond just their own faiths. And also think of the importance of developing character, about leadership, about things, which is lacking in our fundamental school um, sort of curricula at the moment. It's very much, uh, in a sense, a step back, but a step bringing them to the basics, a foundation on which they can be. So we are not attempting something very big, trying to expand them too much, but getting them to come back to the base, to understand the foundations on which um, all sort of character and education and uh, leadership and personal growth is built on, uh, rather than sort of getting them to understand the whole kind of possibilities uh, and perceptions. Well, it's a very nice segue into my question, which was, um, I'd really like to understand what the concept of leadership is in Sri Lanka. I mean, it's that in itself is quite a kind of concept, you know, contested notion. And um, I'd, I'd love to get some insight in how that's manifested in the East Asian context. I think that's a very good question for you. Now, for, in fact, for instance, this, this is so. It's very difficult to, for many young people to understand concepts like leadership because they see leaders perhaps as all powerful, sometimes mm -hmm. oppressive, uh, very autocratic in nature. Whereas the modules that we would, would bring them back to certain leadership concepts of saying if Lord Buddha was a leader, then what were the qualities he had if he had so much influence? Uh, over uh, a great number of people and, and get them to think through some of these basic concepts of maybe even servant leadership in, in Christian circles, uh, where leadership is not just being this person you see every day as a cutout when you <laughs> walk out of your home or travel in the bus, where you know, so many leaders are sort of staring at you by the roadside or on television and then claiming that they are the saviors of the people. So these are sort of conflict leadership roles that they see and some of the kids may aspire or think that this is the real leadership that we need to offer when we are big and it is not so. So this would be a, a challenge to those uh, concepts which are out there, which are really challenging. So, through it would be a very non-threatening way to approach different leadership styles through the religious teachings uh, that uh, we sort of bring in to bear. Thank you. Um, John. I'd like to turn that back to sort of talk about my, thank you so much for your talk. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, so you shared the slides uh, from mm. uh, Professor Silver, the anthropologist, where uh, on, the, on the quotes where it says um, about during times of uncertainty and danger, people often use rituals to reduce their stress and to control their environment. And um, you drew attention to the sort of religious rituals, which are like the morally questionable, you know, we have the about some of them. Um, now flourishing 
there's several pathways to human flourishing that have been outlined in the literature, one of which is religious community as a major way of facilitating well-being. And so my question for you is um, whether you think that in Sri Lanka, such a religious country, that predominance of religion has helped people to continue to flourish or support the flourishing during uncertainty, or whether the rituals would actually be something that's positively contributed to well-being on the whole, in spite of some of the negative aspects to it. Difficult question, though. In fact, I, I mean, I could have some colleagues, you know, challenging me on this uh, same issue. Yeah. Uh, and many, many of them are. Many colleagues would uh, sort of tell me that religion or uh, these traditions have been counterproductive and in many instances been more harmful to people. Uh, for instance, there was uh, uh, a professor of pharmacology promoting a, a dubious uh, concoction for which we people paid uh, big amounts of money to buy because they believed that it could help them overcome COVID. So, there are many aspects which are harmful, so it's, it's, it's an ongoing debate. Mm -hmm. I don't want to support, and that, that is the sort of thin line I tread when I uh, speak on this aspect, because lots of people could take it that I'm supporting the, the traditions and the religions and, and uh, the interpretations and activities that are going on. Uh, to me, it is not so much about supporting them or saying that they are good or bad, but looking at them in terms of perhaps the individual person and seeing how if we were to accept that their mental schema is determined by certain beliefs or certain faith, how we can bring that in in terms of delivering something or encouraging flourishing, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily supporting a religion or its practices, but accepting certain realities and trying to see or tease out the factors that may be encouraging flourishing and enabling them rather than sort of uh, dismissing them. Um, I have another question, which is, do you think your position as a psych psychiatrist has helped you um, engage with the school environment, i.e. you're seen as kind of objective or coming from the perspective of science? Or, um, you know, when you, as you've developed this program and really kind of in response to the question that Emily asked was, how did you get the buy in? from you know, the public public policy. Do you think um, you know, your position enabled that? And what, does, what do you think that says about the relationship between or perception of scientists within that very religious and spiritual context? I must say, I have uh, kept myself out of the sort of mainstream delivery uh, in this whole uh, project. Um, because there are two reasons for this. One is, as you said, the perception that may be predetermined on the part of the people receiving it. And I don't want it to be a perception where psychiatrist is bringing something forward, although they know that psychiatrists are involved in the development of these modules. Perhaps what sort of brings some influence into the fact is that I belong to a university department and I'm a professor and I have a psychiatry background, which sort of implies I know about perhaps character, human minds and how it works. <laughs> but I don't sort of directly get involved in the delivery or the interaction with the teachers or the students um, in terms of the delivery process. Um, that's one aspect of it. And the second aspect of it is that I wouldn't be seen as 
someone who is religious or spiritual, of having a background where I have the right to bring out the religious uh, uh, in Sri Lanka, because I must say that many of these beliefs and faiths are new to me. I grew up in a different city, and I come from a predominantly Christian background, so, which is really a minority religious background in, in the Sri Lankan context. So uh, the mainstream religious people may not see me as somebody who understands or knows their religion. So I, for these two reasons, I don't sort of engage directly. And I, this module is delivered in Singhala. And I'm not the most conversant in Singhala in terms of uh, my language skills. So do you have locals then delivering? OK. How, how does the module overcome the, you know, the historic tensions, uh, the, you know, language, is, as you know better than I, uh, the main driver of the conflict in Sri Lanka as it, as it, uh, as it was? Um, and uh, so in, in delivering a word such as this, has that found a way of uh, ensuring that any of these historical emotional tensions, particularly the language festival? So it's been, some of the modules are quite interesting. It, it sort of brings out hypothetical situations where you sort of transfer to a university in one of the Tamil speaking areas. and and they have certain situations in which uh, their emotions and how they react is sort of understood and they're given opportunities to sort of vent or, or say what they feel about the different situations they come across. So these opportunities are built into the modules for them to also express themselves and also to get of different responses that one could give the situation uh, when they're faced with someone of another religion or another language. And, uh, and who, who mediates that if these discussions get out of hand or, uh, or don't they, which I'm very surprised if they didn't. So, um, so when they, so it's not a, not a discussion as such, so it's something they, each one does individually, oh, so individual. they go through it. Yeah. So when they go through this module, it's more like a game where they have various options and then you, they click on that and then they find that you know that may cause other difficulties and other problems the conflict may worsen and so on and so forth whereas another situation may diffuse the situation and so on right. so it's uh, you know 12 to 14 year olds engaging with different situations trying yeah. to learn what would be best but just getting that to think mm. which is the main sort of driving Sort of educational tool that we have. We don't sort of didactically tell them, look, this is good, this is bad. Yeah. But getting them into situations and try to work through them. Sure, the data is fascinating. Getting out, the, hopefully, the first uh, the initial data is being analyzed at the moment. Get uh, some of them, pen and paper, maybe out. Well, um, any final questions or comments from the floor or online? Well, in that case, I'd like to say warm thank you for a fascinating talk and a very lively conversation, and in particular for making it to Oxford. <laughs> so we're so excited to have you here. And now we shall indulge in our, you know, important um, community building aspects of drinks and high table. So thank you to you all online and see you again same time next week. Thank you.